This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. Asia is quickly becoming one of the most important geographic areas in the world in terms of economic and military power, with China leading the way for the region as a rising superpower and contender versus the United States. Remembering its past humiliations by Western powers over the 20th and 19th centuries, China is looking to a future where it once more is amongst the most prominent global powers, if not the most powerful of all. This means one thing pushing the United States out of the Pacific and claiming regional hedge money. But is a war between East and West inevitable as many believe? And could China unite all of Asia in a bid to fight off the world's leading superpower? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at the possibility of a conflict between USA and Asia and what that might look like. First, is such a conflict even possible? In a very real sense, the answer is simply no. The US and China, as well as rest of Asia, simply share too many economic ties to make going to war an easy choice for either side. In January alone, the US exported over $36 billion worth of goods to Asia, while importing $93 billion. For 2018, those figures are 510 billion exports versus $1.1 billion imports. This includes everything from electronics to automobiles to gaming consoles. With just China alone, the US exports around $120 billion and imports $540 billion. The flow of cash going both ways along with hard goods is an economic lifeline that has created great prosperity for both regions. Though the trade deficit between the US and Asia actually means that it would be Asia who suffers more from a war against the US rather than vice versa, as Asia has more to lose financially. Then there's the actual goods being swapped between the countries. The US mostly imports cheap consumer goods from Asia, along with computer equipment and machinery, while on the other hand the US exports large amounts of foodstuffs, airplanes, and high-tech machinery. In case of war, the US would face a shortage of computer equipment, specifically microchips, but it's well equipped to quickly transition to other available markets or begin massive domestic production. Asia on the other hand would be hard hit by cuts of major food imports from the US, along with high technology machinery. A crippling blow against the US would be the loss of rare earth materials that it currently imports from Asia which would severely undercut manufacture of new high-tech computer hardware for the duration of the conflict. But in return, Asia would face a complete blockade of American information technologies that would throw their computer systems into disarray. War clearly doesn't appeal to either side. What about politically though? Would a regional war even be possible? On its own, China simply does not have the capability to defeat the United States militarily. Its navy is woefully under-equipped versus the United States' zone who supports 11 supercarriers versus China's two training carriers, which are not certified for combat operations. There's also a huge disparity in aircraft technology between the two nations, with 1,700 aircraft of which a third are antiquated J-7 fighters and only a fourth are fourth-gen J-10s and J-11s, which are on par with American F-15s and F-16s. Despite much propaganda about the development of its fifth-generation stealth fighter, China's J-20 is only recently entering operational readiness and is not fielded in large numbers. The plane also notably lacks a cannon, meaning that the Chinese have no illusions about getting into a dogfight versus American planes, which is a good thing, as its flight characteristics show that it cannot outfight even a fourth-generation jet such as the F-16 in a dogfight. Instead, the Chinese J-20 relies on powerful sensors to fire on enemy targets at great distances, much like the American F-35 or F-22 Raptor. However, unlike its American counterparts, China fields a much lower number of fifth-generation fighters and even less aerial support or space-based assets with which to capitalize on all the features of a beyond-visual-range fighter such as the J-20 or F-35. This means that in the case of war, the J-20 will likely see great success initially against older F-15s or F-16s, but the superior number of American 5th and 4th gen aircraft would inevitably overwhelm meager numbers of J-20s. Of course, in the case of such a large war as a China-US conflict, the US would lead its attack with the F-22, indubitably the most advanced non-experimental aircraft in the world putting even Chinese J-20s at great risk in the opening days of the conflict. The US, on the other hand, fields a force of over 2,000 aircraft, 
all of which are either 4th generation or 5th generation, with more 5th gen F-35s replacing older F-15s and F-16s every year. As the region's premier air power, China not only is already behind the US in terms of air power, but struggles to close a gap that the US keeps growing every year. Both nations have already cast their eyes toward the future with the development of a sixth-generation fighter. But while China has only recently announced its pursuit of a sixth-gen fighter, the US has already been developing its own model for years, with some of its more advanced electronics and computer technology being prototyped in its next-generation bomber program, which expects to field a flying prototype within the next few years. The air power situation simply isn't set to improve much for China, unfortunately, as analysts have predicted that the slow rollout of its J-20 fighter and inferior flight characteristics are due to China instead choosing to focus its efforts on the development of a sixth-generation fighter, basically all but abandoning its fifth-gen design in hopes of leapfrogging the United States with a breakthrough sixth-gen fighter. If it were to actually accomplish such a task, it would certainly change the balance of power in the Pacific dramatically in China's favor. But such an occurrence is far from realistic, given the US's historical strength in creating the most technologically advanced aircraft in the world. However, China's strategy isn't completely without merit, as the US has been forced to spend billions in support of its fifth-generation fleet, money that China could instead funnel directly into a sixth-generation design. It's a risky proposition for China, no doubt, and threatens to leave the nation without an adequate fighter for the next decade or two. And if it fails to beat the US to a sixth-generation design, could leave China a second-rate air power for the century to come. Other Asiatic nations do of course field their own air forces, which they could lend to the battle. Yet, with the exception of Japan, India, and South Korea, none of these nations field modern fighters in large enough numbers to be effective. Most of these nations also do not have the ability to support long-range flight operations with capable airborne early warning and aerial refueling aircraft, limiting their usefulness in combat. A crippling lack of electronic warfare assets would also leave their aircraft and surface vessels vulnerable to American electronic attack. The best that other nations could do would be to play coastal defense against incursions by American stealth aircraft as seeking out US naval ships and taking out American naval or air power at sea would be a suicide mission even for China. Yet the one advantage that China does have over the US is its formidable ballistic missile stockpile, sporting thousands of missiles with ranges from 300 to 1500 kilometers, all designed specifically to keep the US Navy at bay and American air power away from its shores. The US has responded in kind by prioritizing ballistic missile defense systems, prototyping everything from advanced electronic attack space and airborne platforms to kinetic and energy-based missile defense systems such as interceptor missiles and laser systems. While keeping any specific capabilities close to his chest, one American admiral did recently comment that he did not fear Chinese ballistic missile threats. And given the US's continued use of aircraft carriers in the Pacific, the statement might signify that the Chinese ballistic missile threat is not as formidable as it seems on paper, either due to US defenses or, as many suspect, because China lacks the technological sophistication to execute every complex link in a kill chain that would require careful coordination and sharing of data between space and ground-based platforms to the actual kill vehicle itself. These are the links in a chain that can be individually attacked, defeating the entire threat, and many analysts suspect that China does not have the capability to properly execute such an attack, nor defend every link in that kill chain from American electronic or kinetic attack. Yet the vast numbers of available ballistic missiles might prove China's Cold War era mentality that quantity is a quality all in its own right, as even with limited success, sheer numbers would no doubt inflict catastrophic losses amongst the US Pacific Fleet in the opening days of the war. Unfortunately, China lacks the ability to follow up on its initial successes. Its air force is poorly suited for anything but home defense and has little if any expeditionary capabilities amongst its armed forces. China could very well force the US Pacific Fleet back and savage key US bases at Pearl Harbor and Guam, but without the ability to project power past its own shores, it would be unable to capitalize on its initial successes and keep the US out of the Pacific for good. The US would simply rebuild and regroup its forces, weathering out the initial stockpile of ballistic missiles before retaliating. Lastly, there's the simple political question if such a war is even feasible. For China, the local situation is grim. It simply lacks any real regional allies. With modern nations such as Japan and South Korea all closely aligned with the United States, its poor treatment of lesser regional powers such as Vietnam and the Philippines 
also means that China would find itself very hard-pressed to find any real allies. Its simmering hostilities with India also means that any cooperation between the two is all but impossible. In short, the region lacks the political will to band together with China for an all-out war against the US. A US-Asia war would have no real winners. Both sides would suffer catastrophically. Though with no ability to threaten the US homeland, it is China and any allies it finds who would suffer the most. In the end, such a war is not only impossible but completely unrealistic. And we hope that our modern politicians remember this fact. We know military and government attacks are getting more and more sophisticated, and the real target of that is you. Your data and identity is what they're all after, and you need to make sure you keep it all secure. For that reason, we here at the Infographics Show have been using Dashlane. You no longer need to subscribe to five different services to be safe and secure online. Dashlane is the one and only tool you need. Their multi-country VPN lets you browse safely and privately, no matter where you are, across any device. Don't leave yourself vulnerable to digital snooping or malicious hackers. Give Dashlane and its features-packed VPN a try today. We love using Dashlane because not only does it act as a best-in-class VPN, it will send you breach alerts for when one of your online accounts is compromised by a hack. Head on over to www.dashlane.com infographics for a free 30-day trial. And if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. How do you think such a war would play out? Also, check out our other video, USA vs. North Korea, who would win? Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.